Potter. Out of all of the characters from Harry Potter, I really don't think there's anyone more underrated than Narcissa Malfoy. When I think of my favourite characters from the books, I associate how they act in terms of their impact on the story and how I relate to them myself personally, which is why Remus Lubin, Sirius Black and Cedric Diggory are some of my favourite characters because of their stories. But I can't ignore how fantastic a character Narcissa Malfoy is. Now don't confuse me for her being a fantastic person, no, I'm just talking about her character. She's so brilliantly written and I feel that you can only see that from piecing together the examples of her cleverness from the books and from her background in general. Narcissa Malfoy fooled everyone, not just the Dark Lord, and in today's video I'm going to explain how she played the perfect role. I've said in the video's introduction that I love how Narcissa's character is written and that you really have to pay attention and piece certain things together to truly understand her brilliance. It was only when I was thinking about the Black Sisters' fates that it actually hit me. Narcissa Malfoy absolutely nailed it. She played her role to a T and it really shows. How does it show? Well, let's start with her childhood, her family heritage. If you're a Harry Potter fan that hasn't been living under a rock, then you'll know that Narcissa comes from the House of Black, a prestigious pureblood family who are avid supporters of keeping the magical bloodlines pure, so much to the point of disowning or banishing family members for failing to comply with what the family heritage demanded. Narcissa's parents heavily enforced such ideologies upon her, along with her two sisters, Andromeda and Bellatrix. Our family is the noble and most ancient house of black. You will all contribute to carrying on a pure magical bloodline. If you do not obey or agree to our arrangements, you will be banished from this household and stripped of your rights as a member of the black family. Do you understand? expected to marry into pure-blooded families of a similar stature and continue on the tradition of maintaining a pure bloodline society. Andromeda married Muggle-born Ted Tonks and was disowned by her parents. Bellatrix married Rodolphus the Strange, a man she didn't love and bore no children for, just for the sake of keeping her parents happy. Narcissa however really played this one cleverly. She wasn't going to marry a man she didn't love. She also wasn't going to entertain a Muggleborn or Half-Blood, so what was wrong with actually finding a pure-blooded wizard who she genuinely liked? She's happy, her parents are happy, the pure-blood community are happy. You'd think it was that simple, but as I've mentioned, her sisters didn't really set great examples. Narcissa was showing that the smart choice doesn't have to be separated from the right choice. They can be combined to give successful results. It's quite possible she chose Lucius Malfoy for his eligibility at first, but was open to getting to know him, then eventually fell in love with him. Even as Lucius delved deeper and deeper into his service to Lord Voldemort, and began fully embracing his Death Eater role, Narcissa stood by him, quietly. She never openly stated her support to the Dark Lord. Yeah, she made a couple of snotty remarks in her time, some of which we've seen directed at Harry Potter himself, but Narcissa always remained in the perfect position to exit. She never actually became a Death Eater, never received the Dark Mark tattoo on her arm. Why she never joined him is still unclear, and I did make a video giving my take on that situation that you can check out in the links below. But what is clear is that she was allowed into the inner circle regardless, which is highly unusual if you're not a Death Eater. Voldemort would always require some form of commitment, but when I actually thought about the situation, it wasn't loyalty from Narcissa that Voldemort needed, but her presence would ensure the unwavering loyalty of her husband. Lucius knew all too well that his wife would be at full risk should he ever think of betraying Voldemort. It also made him uneasy at the fact Narcissa was so vulnerable, which in turn was something that the Dark Lord most likely enjoyed. In saying that, she held her own. She spoke nothing but words of support, 
and anything that the Dark Lord wished of her husband, Narcissa would not object to. She basically sat on the fence, waiting to choose her moment when the balance shifted. Narcissa was never on the end of a threat to go to Azkaban after the First War, yet she was by Lucy's side. Even when he did go to Azkaban, nothing was done with her. Yes, she watched, but she was safe. She cared too much about her family to see them go down. Draco was everything to her. His safety came before everything and anyone else. She knew that Severus Snape was the only person she could turn to in order to help her with Draco's assignment of assassinating Albus Dumbledore. She chose Severus because of his close connection to Lucius, something which is basically non-existent in the movie and in all honesty I would have loved to see more of it. If any of you have ever watched the movies and wondered why Snape was never exactly as hard on Draco as he was other students, Harry Potter, it's because of Lucius. Lucius looked out for Snape during their Hogwarts days. He was older and welcomed Snape into the Slytherin fold. Anyway, as I was saying, Narcissa knew that she could only turn to Snape. She even convinced the Bellatrix to come with her, something which even shocked me due to Bella's dedication and loyalty to Lord Voldemort, showing that she did care for her family, although she was not too happy about it. At one point, I even believed that Bellatrix felt like she was still her own person and could make decisions for herself that did not directly revolve around the Dark Lord. That was until she suggested the Unbreakable Vow. By doing so, she ensured that either her master's greatest threat Albus Dumbledore would die or her doubts about Severus Snape were true, he was a traitor and he dropped dead if he hesitated. Either way, she contributed to helping Lord Voldemort and I thought, there we go. There's her motive. Narcissa knew that Draco was being set up to fail, as did Bellatrix. With Snape's assistance, she knew Draco was safe for now, but that nothing was guaranteed. At a certain point, Narcissa checked out of Team Voldemort. Not that she was in that much anyway, but she knew that events had become extreme and that something had to be done, but there was little she could do unless an opportunity presented itself for her to be of a certain assistance but still remain discreet. Remember Narcissa's line of thinking, if she can get what she wants while keeping everyone happy, then it's a win for her. Her moment to shift the balance finally came when Harry Potter met the Dark Lord in the Forbidden Forest. The boy came to die willingly, he put up no resistance and was struck with a vicious killing curse. Voldemort put his whole might behind it, knocking him off his feet as well as Harry. When Narcissa went to check the boy, she crossed the point of no return. If she didn't act out her role flawlessly, she was as good as dead. Narcissa lied directly to the Dark Lord by informing him that Harry was dead when he was in fact still alive. She traded her loyalty to Voldemort for the information on the well-being of her son. She was done and Harry knew that as well. Narcissa knew that her aiding Harry would not go unnoticed by Harry or even the Ministry. Harry's moral fibre would not allow him to withhold that information. Lying to Voldemort on his behalf and not participating in the Battle of Hogwarts was more than enough proof that she, her husband and their son had abandoned the Death Eaters and changed allegiance. As many of us are aware, the Ministry's judicial system is so flawed that it's a borderline embarrassment. Past events have shown that Ministry officials have been so desperate to find the perpetrators that they'll give any deal they want in order to get them. They allowed Igor Karkaroff to walk free after his conviction of being a Death Eater. This man brutally tortured Muggles and Muggleborns and most likely killed people too. Oh, and also went on to become headmaster of a school. Yeah, please give the Ministry of Magic the special Medal of Smartness for that genius decision. My point being is that Narcissa was all too well aware that her efforts would see little to no punishment, so by helping Harry, she appeals to everyone. Harry gains a little respect for her. Her son and husband are safe, they all get off free and live happily ever after. Now, it's not that she didn't want to see Voldemort meet his demise, but her decision had a more beneficial effect on her and her family. She also learned from previous experiences how to approach certain situations. When Draco insisted that his child would not be brought up in the manner that he was, 
which is obviously as a pure blood supremacist, Narcissa accepted that decision, even if Lucius wasn't too happy about it. I honestly feel that Narcissa was just so clever through the entire series, but more so through the war. From Voldemort's return and onwards, that's when she was most effective. But she seemed to always be in control of the decisions she was making, even when she knew they were difficult. She must have been scared going to Snape, but knew she had to. She must have been terrified lying to Voldemort, but knew she had to, and then blocked out the Dark Lord with occlumence. She really did own her character, and as I said at the start of this video, she is brilliantly written. She also showed that a mother's love is a mother's love no matter what side you're on, no matter who your allegiance is to. Narcissa fooled everyone, her parents, the Dark Lord, the Ministry officials. She played the perfect game, a risky game, but in the end, she won. So with that being said everyone, that is my video on how Narcissa Malfoy fooled everyone. Thank you so much for watching, it's really really appreciated. Make sure to check out my other videos, especially the ones on Riddle and Animated Story, my upcoming series on the early years of Tom Riddle. Thanks again everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, I truly truly appreciate your support. Everyone, notifications of uploads are more important than ever, so please if you haven't already, turn those notifications on to make sure you're notified the moment my video goes live. Making videos is what I love to do, it's my dream and my passion, however it does cost time and money to produce this content, so if you have a dollar to spare to support me on Patreon, in exchange for some exclusive unseen content, then you can click the Patreon link below or at the end of this video. Please only support me if you can afford it. And make sure to follow me on Instagram at InstaDNJ and on Twitter at Potter Folklore. Check out my other videos appearing on screen and please make sure, most importantly, to hit that subscribe button. Thanks again everyone and please have a great day.